Hi, my name is George Garcia, and I am a community manager with Fusion 360 Electronics and Eagle. In this video, we're going to continue our series on the signal integrity extension, and we're now going to see what can we do with the insight that the signal integrity extension is providing to us. So this is where we left off in our previous video. And from the first video in this series where we go over some basics of signal integrity, we now want to see, well, what do we need to do in order to get our traces to meet the requirements? So the first thing we want to see is the fact that we have a lot of variability in the impedance of our traces. So if right now we're looking at the DN signal. We're going to notice that we have variations or orange areas up near where that via is over here. We also have variations near the two coupling capacitors that are on the left side near the trace. So how can we improve the consistency of the impedance? So that's problem number one. Right now, we have a lot of variation. If we can at least get it to be more uniform, then we can worry about getting it where we want it to be. And we have a similar problem with DP. You'll notice that we have a, a pretty big orange area in the middle, again, near that via. And obviously on the ends, both traces have quite a bit of variation in the impedance. Now, why? Well, like we saw in the first video in this series, in order for a signal to see a constant impedance, the cross section needs to stay constant. The geometry can't change. Anytime you have a change in geometry, well, that's going to cause a change in the impedance of the trace C's. And that's what we're seeing here. If we look carefully, I'm going to go ahead and exit the analyzed signal. The polygon breaks right here, as well as beneath the DN signal. So that change in the geometry is causing the impedance in those areas of the traces to increase. So the first thing we have to do to improve the impedance or make it more consistent along the trace is we need to make some room so that way the polygons can fill. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go ahead and try to create a little bit of separation between this via right here and the signal so that hopefully we have enough room to be able to get the polygon to fully fill. I'll also probably have to reroute this differential pair to try to give more space so that the polygon beneath the DN signal can also fill. And that way we have nice consistent geometry all the way around. So those are going to be the goals now. I'm going to go ahead and do some rerouting and move some items around. That way we can improve the profile of our impedance on the trace. Try to make it more consistent the whole length of the trace. So that's what I'm going to do now. So at this point, we've initially improved the, the polygon fill. So now we're going to notice that DP is probably going to improve. Now, if you look on the left side, you're going to notice the analysis is out of date. So let's go ahead and refresh that analysis. And as we look, this has improved the situation considerably. Our trace has a much more consistent impedance all through its length. Now we still have work to do because as you can see, I still have a little gap up on the top left. And obviously I haven't done anything for the gap underneath DN. So now I'm going to go ahead and work to improve this. But before I continue, you're going to notice that we have some other issues that I kind of want to address. If we look especially near the ends of the traces, we have a lot of impedance changing there. Now why? If we look, we're going to notice that the separation between DP and DN isn't fixed, isn't constant. And like we mentioned in the Signal Integrity 101 video, any change in geometry, anything that's nearby to the trace that can couple, is going to affect the impedance. And if you notice, on the ends, we're having quite a bit of, of a change in that gap. So especially here in the beginning, if we look at both traces, we're going to see that we start off with a bigger separation, and then as the traces come together, then we have the, a thinner separation. And this is especially bad on the opposite end, where these resistors are, 
you can notice that we have a big separation there. So that's going to create lots of variability. So at this point, we're probably going to be better off just rerouting this differential pair. Now that we've made some room for it, we should be much more successful in getting a constant impedance profile. Additionally, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to separate from the decoupling caps, C2 and C24, because those are also affecting the impedance profile of D, D underscore N. So I'm going to go ahead and reroute this, and let's see if we can get a better profile. So at this point, we're going to notice that things have improved quite a bit. So now we have much more consistent spacing over a larger portion of the length of the two traces. We still have some problems with the poly. It's not fully filling in. We're going to see if we can do something about that now. But if we redo our analysis, we should see generalized improvement. Let's go ahead and do that. So if we look everywhere we have a gap in the poly, we have that change in impedance, so we still want to see if we can improve that. Let's look in the DP trace. Again, wherever there's a gap in the poly, we still have that issue. Let's go ahead and try to improve the poly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the width of the polygon, see if I can get it to fill in with a higher resolution, and that may solve our problem. So at this point, I changed the width of the polygon to be finer. That way it has a better chance of filling in, and it's almost perfect. We have still probably a little notch here on the D underscore N signal, but I'm going to call that good for now. So let's go ahead and redo our analysis. Okay, excellent. So if we look, we've addressed our first concern, which is the variability in the impedance of the trace. We'll notice it's much more consistent overall. We just have some changes near the ends, which are going to happen because that's where the differential pairs break off. And then where we have a few, any little gap here in the poly, we're going to see that the impedance changes for a very short segment. So it's not even a, a concern, really. Now, one thing you may be wondering is why is it at the corners that there's a change? You notice that at all the corners, there's a little bit of a change. Okay, and the reason this happens is subtle, but it's worth noting. In this case, it's not really a problem. It's not going to make a big difference, but let's go ahead and mention it anyway. Remember how we mentioned in the first video of the series that any change in the geometry is going to lead to a change in impedance. So if I had perfectly rounded corners, if, if this was, these were rounded traces, then we could say that the width of dp and dn is constant the whole way through. However, whenever we have a corner, whenever we have a bend, the width changes ever so slightly because now you have a hypotenuse there. It forms a triangle at the corner, and it's actually slightly lar larger in width. And that's what causes these little impedance changes whenever, whenever you have a corner. So notice in the corners, that's what's going on. Again, not a big deal. Not really a major problem. So for now, I'm going to call this good. I'm comfortable with where, where this is at. We've addressed the first problem, which was that we have a lot of impedance variation within our trace. Now, our second problem is that we're still out of range. So how can we improve the impedance of our traces? Well, again, from our first video in this series, you'll note that one of the knobs that we have to adjust impedance is trace width. If we make our traces wider, then we can get a lower impedance, which is what we want in this case. So what we're going to do now is, again, we're going to have to reroute these traces, um, but I'm going to reroute them wider. And hopefully that will get us closer to our desired impedance profile. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to change the net class to specify the impedance I want. Sorry, to specify the width I want. And then I'll reroute the differential pair using this new width.
So at this point, I made the traces wider, but then again, we have the issue with the polygon. So I'm going to try to fix that also by creating a little bit more space. And then we're going to run our analysis again. So at this point, I've been able to make some room for the polygon to fill. Now our geometry is much more consistent. Let's go ahead and run our analysis again. You know, if we look, things look a much better. You notice our impedance has improved. We're no longer in the 80s. We're down from 88.6 down to 69.7 maximum in the worst case, with the average being a little bit better. We're in that 52 to 58 range. Still not on target, so not where we want it to be, but we have improved it considerably. Now let's look at DP. Again, also much more consistent. We only have variations on the ends. Now at this point, if we still want to hit our target, which we do, we do want to be within 15% of 45 ohms, we could try going wider. But given that this is already a pre, you know almost a fully routed board, I don't really have much space to try to, to make wider traces. So at this point, what we can do is we can use another knob that we spoke about in the first video, which is changing the dielectric thickness. Now this is where the layer stack manager comes into play. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the layer stack manager. And you're going to notice that we have between the top and the next nearest layer, we have two dielectrics here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this one. Now, this particular knob is one that is requires a lot more work to be able to do because you need to have good communication with your board house. You need to know what stack up they're going to use, what stack up they can do. All of these details have to be worked out with them because right now I'm removing a, di a piece of dielectric material um, and my manufacturer may not be able to deal with that. So... Before you go down this route, you have to make sure that your board house can, can, can construct the stack up you want to make. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. I'm going to right click, say delete. I'm going to say apply and then cancel. What you're going to notice again, now unless this is out of date, we're going to go ahead and run it again, update the results, and let's see what happens. So as you can see, we were able to get within target by making this final adjustment of the dielectric thickness. So the key takeaways here is that using the signal integrity extension, we can find signal integrity problems before we commit to hardware. Had this board been made before producing this analysis, it's possible it wouldn't have worked because we had such a variation in the trace impedance and it was outside of spec anyway. So at the high bit rates, this likely wouldn't have worked at all. So I want to thank you for watching this video with us and for your interest in the signal integrity extension. In the final video of this series, I'm going to show you what we can do with the extracted parameters that the signal integrity extension gives us. Because we've been focusing so far completely on impedance. But we also have time delay. We have resistance of the trace. We have the capacitance and we have the inductance of the trace. And using these parameters in the next video, we're going to show how with these extracted parameters, we can actually make a transient simulation of what signals will look like as they're traveling down this trace. So how they start on one end and how they end up at the other. So stay tuned for the next video, the final video of this series, using the signal integrity extension within Fusion 360. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.